so g good day everybody and you're very welcome to this um technical meeting of the cmps um we're, we're hoping to hold these uh, fortnightly and uh, the uh, alternate fortnights will be hosted uh, by david um to hilster which will be you know the the, the more normal type of uh, conversational uh, subjects that we'll be covering but today um and every two weeks thereafter there'll be the more technical uh, subjects now what we've been doing is we've been looking at the whole subject of unipolar induction and um uh, uh harry uh, uh h ricker the third sorry say again okay uh H harry i've given him his full Breaking title but... up a little bit are you say again? did you start the... yeah it, we started now harry i'm introducing you we're not quite ready yet can you hear me you're you're breaking up here. I'm breaking up. Can, can yeah, you I hear me, Franklin? Up, yeah, I can hear you. I think. Uh, uh, I think there might be some problem with your sound, Harry, because you you were breaking up a bit. But anyway, let me finish the introduction, and then we'll we'll get you talking. And we'll see can you up. Yeah. So um. So Harry gave a presentation. Uh, it's our last um. Uh, alternative meeting held over Zoom on uh, unipolar induction. And he, he went through the whole history of all the re research that's been done over the last 170 years, basically starting from Faraday's uh, experiments. Now, um, we, we decided to concentrate on this subject and keep at it. It's a, it's a very complex subject and so much work has been done. And, you know, it's hard to know whether we're getting anywhere. We're getting a lot of different theories which seem to fit the, the facts. But we have to isolate uh, one theory that, that that's the most um, resonant. So, uh, so today, Harry will be speaking more generally on electromagnetic induction. And of course, unipolar induction is a subset of that. So he'll be talking uh, about that. And uh, again, I, I'm sure he'll be giving us as much detail as he did the last time. We'll have some time for discussion at the end. But we basically hope that um, Harry would be allowed to present uh, uninterrupted. Now, if you have some major problem that you didn't understand what he said, or there's a terrible echo or you, some strange word he used, you could inter in, interrupt him. I don't think he'll mind that and he'll explain it. But we'll, we'll leave the more... Uh, discussion uh, points to the end uh, and uh, with regard to this subject that we're sticking on for a little while maybe during the month of December because um, I think it'll be next week now, it was going to be the 10th but I think it'll be the 3rd, we'll, we'll announce it Bob Gray will be giving uh, a talk on unipolar induction from Weber's point of view, from Weber Electrodynamics point of view and uh, I myself will be probably giving one maybe two weeks after that on the uh, um, experiments of, of A.G. Kelly, which, which were undertaken over a period of three years. So um, without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll hand over to you, Harry, now. I'll, I'll bring your picture up. Um, you, you'll forgive me for a few teething problems because this is the first time that the alternative meetings have used, Zoom, uh, have used StreamYard. Um, so I want to bring Harry up now. All right. Are we but you have an echo, Harry, are which is... Are we concerning. recording? Are we recording? Uh, we, we are recording now, yes. We are. I, I'm, I'm having a hard time standing. Are we recording this? Uh, sorry, are you asking if we are recording, the recording this? Recording is... Okay. Okay. Well, uh, I'm not going on here. Yeah, Harry, we're having problems with uh, hearing you. I would suggest All right. that. So it's uh, live. All right. I guess so. That you turn off All your right. camera to save bandwidth. Um, yeah, Harry, can you turn off your camera to save bandwidth? Because right now, I think yeah. Harry's uh, internet connection doesn't not fast enough. Can, can you hear us, Harry? Franklin is suggesting you that you might me? turn your video off to save bandwidth. Is, is it working? Right now, we have we can't hear you, Harry. No. 
you have limited uh, internet bandwidth, so we need to have you turn off your camera. Well, um, we have lost, uh, lost Harry for the moment. I might be able to um, All right. do that. Then it's not sufficient. Uh, no, I, I can only kick him out. I don't seem to be able to get rid of his video. Well, maybe there is something I'm doing. <clears throat> okay, there we go. So Harry's got... Uh, you need to keep your video off, I think. Okay. All right. I'm from well, okay, I think that's better, is it? Can you hear um, us now, Harry? I can't hear you again. And, and you're much better. We can hear you now. So so go ahead. Um. Okay, Harry, we've got your screen, and I think you can go ahead and start your presentation. Do you hear us, Harry? Yeah, sorry, we're having, you know, teething yeah. problems here, getting these things working. All set to go. I think I gave my... Uh, inner no, you've gone a bit um breaking up again, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm not sure one of those unfortunate things that if the internet is not cooperating, okay, we, we've got I didn't say that. Okay. I'm going to talk about electromagnetic induction from a general point of view. So does everybody hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Good. All right. And you see the uh, screen presentation on the screen? We do. Yeah. All right. And I'm going to switch here to the larger format. You see the larger format? That's we better. Do. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, electromagnetic induction. Can 100 years of confusion be resolved using scientific method? And I think the answer, the question is, does the scientific method work? And I think the answer is, if we have 100 years of confusion, it's actually more than 100 years of confusion, but I rounded it off. Um, and is the scientific method working? Well, maybe not. So my thesis is the main problem is uh, confusion caused by too many contradictory opinions. And I think um, we'll see this if you go to, like say, Wikipedia and you look at uh, Faraday's law page and uh, the Faraday paradox page, you'll see there's um, a lot of confusion going on, particularly if you go to the talk page where people say, um, you know, what, what it says on the main page of Wikipedia is wrong. So that's an example of uh, confusion that's going on. So what's causing this? Okay, well, I think there's just too many theories, um, too many different ideas, too many config, conflicting opinions, you have unclear concepts of uh, theoretical concepts. And I'll talk a little bit about what's kind of unclear and confusing. But here I want to talk about more about the historical review and put things into context. Um, and um, I'll try to do that. This is where it gets confusing because You've got Faraday, Michael Faraday. You've got um, uh, James Clerk Maxwell. Uh, you have Albert Einstein. Okay, yeah, those are some pretty big names in science that all have different apparent, apparently different opinions about this um, electromagnetic induction concept. Now, um, the first thing we run into is, uh, what is this EMF? Okay, uh, electromotive force. And that turns out to be kind of an issue of uh, different opinions, ideas, 
and views about what EMF is, where it's produced, how it's produced, and different theories have different um, uh, different conceptions about the EMF and where it comes from. Okay, and um, and I'm going to talk about my main theory thesis here about the Faraday paradox, which is a kind of a modern um, idea, a modern thing that's arisen within the last 20 years. They started calling the unipolar induction problem the Faraday paradox. And it's not really a paradox, and it's they're not really clear exactly what they, it's not clear what they mean by calling uh, unipolar induction Faraday's paradox. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And then down at the bottom, we have the problem of superconductivity. And as we all know, um, a, in a superconductive circuit, there is no voltage. Okay. They resist. I mean, if you have, there's no resistance. And if you have a voltage, the current ought to be infinite. And so this, um, how, how do you induce a current in a superconductor if the resistance is zero, the um, induced current ought to be infinite, but it's not. So um, that's kind of a problem that I've been struggling with for a number of years. Okay, so I'm going to start off with a plug for the CMPS here. And the main issue, um, the main theme that I'm really getting at is um, is the scientific method being applied correctly? Are we doing science correctly? And uh, that's one of the main issues that we're talking about We're in the CNPS. And um, there's a book. Um, this is from a book, Thomas Jefferson Scientist by Edward T. Martin. And I've sort of summarized some of... Uh, Thomas Jefferson's principles, and he taught, and one of them is the freedom of the scientific mind. Yeah, that's real important. Maybe we don't have that today. Guarantee freedom of scientific inquiry. Uh, opposition to tyranny of the mind of mankind. So this is kind of, um, you know, his real, he, he thinks that science is going to free mankind from a lot of um, bad um, tyranny of the mind, primarily, I think, uh, from uh, um, religion and um, monarchy, that sort of thing. And he stresses the independence of conclusions. Okay, so we don't want um, political parties, government, religion, peer review, um, the news media telling us what science ought to be or what science is. And then um, at this particular time when Thomas Jefferson was doing science towards the latter part of the 17th century, uh, they were just beginning to stress the importance of the empirical method, uh, reliance upon observations and experiments. And we're going to see that's kind of an important aspect of this particular subject. And he says, apotheses must be proven by careful observation and experiment. And... Um, you know, of course, everybody in science agrees with that, and we would certainly accept. And then, of course, everything accepted as true must be based on, and uh, oops, we went backwards. Um, uh, in order to have a true conclusion, we have to have a thorough investigation. We have to have the deductions that we arrive at should be based on careful observation and experiments. Okay, now I seem to have uh, I'm going in the wrong direction. So I'm not sure how I go backwards. Well, just press your own um, up and down buttons, I think, Harry. Okay. Right. So we talked about Thomas Jefferson, and now we're talking... Um, Well, it's not working correctly here for some reason. I don't quite. There we go. Up. All right. So now we're up to Michael Faraday. And uh, I guess 
if I try to go, I know what happened here. It inserted a slide that it wasn't supposed to. So let's go back to the slideshow. Okay. Um, so this whole uh, issue of electromagnetic induction was discovered by Michael Faraday here in the United States. We like to give credit to Joseph Henry um, and who also worked on this, um, who is a pioneer. But um, most of the real thorough experimentation was done by Michael Faraday. And um, we begin and it's important to notice here that really what the what he was working on, there were a lot of people working on the problem of how to create magnetism, excuse me, electricity from magnetism, because Erst had discovered that a current in a wire uh, affected the magnetic needle. And so that implied that electricity created magnetism. And a lot of people were working on how can we do the opposite? How can we create electricity from magnetism? And people were working on this, but Faraday was the first one to really uh, do um, uh, experiments that decisively um, uh, demonstrated how electricity could be produced from magnetism. And that started with his toroid ring. He had a toroid ring, which is essentially a transformer. And um, uh, he wound two coils around this iron ring. And when the uh, electricity from a battery was applied to what we today call the primary coil, uh, he noticed that there was a current in the secondary coil, but the current was transient. And that's real important. Now, what's interesting about this is a lot of people had done um, these experiments where they placed um, magnets inside of coils, but they didn't see any, any induction as a result of that. And um, Faraday, who had noticed that the, that the effect was transient. So, and this is important. In other words, it, it, you get a uh, production of electricity and then it dies away and goes away. Well, these earlier experimenters, by the time they connected up there, they didn't really see this transient effect. And so when they applied a magnet to a coil of wire, they didn't see anything because the transient had already died away. And um, I think it's important to, this is an important thing here uh, that we'll see comes up later when we talk about superconductivity. Now, um, one of the things that Faraday discovered was that um, uh, if you move a wire around in front of the pole of a magnet, you get a uh, uh, electricity. And Faraday was using um, what we today call a galvanometer, which is a, a magnet, a, a compass, a magnetic needle, if you will, on which there's a coil of wire. Um, and that's similar to um, um, electric uh, current meters, the Devarsenal meter. And today, basically, you don't see many of these meters where you have the elect have the magnetic field generating. Uh, when a current goes through a coil, it causes the, the needle to move. Those are kind of uh, old fashioned and probably young people today probably never even seen one of those. Um, but anyway, that's similar to what Faraday was using. So he was measuring the current in a galvanometer. And um, when he had a disc placed in front of a, um, a, a magnet, big, powerful magnet, he had this big horseshoe magnet, and the disc was moved, uh, there would be an electric current detected by the galvanometer if you placed one of the wires going to the galvanometer in the center of the disc and the other on the edge, and you had a sliding contact at the edge and you rotated the disc, there would be a, um, a current that would be produced. And um, that's really the beginning of where the unipolar generator um, problem comes in. And kind of one of the real issues here is why would a, um, uh, a disc of metal or um, 
a, a sliding contact produce uh, an electric current. And that's uh, one of the main things that Faraday um, was interested in. He did many, many experiments. And if you read his book, um, it's just tremendous number of different experiments and different variations. Okay, now, as a result of these experiments, Faraday came up with what he thought was the flux, what we, I'm calling, I'm going to call it the flux cutting theory, and that he thought that the wire, um, a wire connected to the galvanometer, if you move this wire across the pole of a magnet, you would get a, um, a current would be produced, and he thought that that was due to the lines of magnetic force being cut or crossed by the by the wire. So he thought that there was um, an in uh, a force that acted to produce the electricity in the wire due to the uh, movement across the lines of of uh, magnetic lines of force. Now, um, when he did this with the um, disc, the rotating disc, um, his idea was that the disc, when it was rotating, rotated perpendicular to the lines of force of the magnet. And so that was what um, created the EMF that was detected. So the disc is rotating or the metallic part of the disc is moving in a direction that's perpendicular to the magnetic lines of force. And so that flux cutting theory would appear to be correct. But um, in his experiments, um, he found that there was a problem. And we're going to, that problem, which is called unipolar induction, um, is that um, when the magnet is rotated, um, you have a magnet beneath the disk. Okay, and, and it's a cylindrical magnet. When that magnet is rotated beneath the disc, there's, there's no EMF, which would tend to indicate that there is a problem with this flux cutting theory. Now, I'm kind of simplifying this. And um, uh, this bothered Faraday and... Um, he was really kind of unable to really resolve this, but his resolution of the difficulty was he decided that the field lines didn't rotate with the magnet. And that is a crucial point. Okay, now we have James Clerk's Maxwell and um, Maxwell takes a different approach. Whereas Faraday was taking the approach of observations and experiments recommended by uh, Thomas Jefferson, where we do thorough investigation, we do a lot of observations, we do experiments. Um, Maxwell was more of a mathematician, and he took more of a deductive approach, what we would today call a deductive mathematical method. So he was constructing um, a mathematical theory of electricity. And um, he created what we today call the Faraday law. Okay. And um, this is a problem because by calling the law that Maxwell developed Faraday's law, it kind of implies that Faraday discovered it or that Faraday did experiments that um, the law was based on. And this is where it gets a little bit unclear because Maxwell's law, if we call it Maxwell's law, which is the uh, sometimes called the uh, flux uh, linking law, um, is not the same thing as the Faraday idea of the flux cutting rule. So now we have two different theoretical ideas that are pretty much going under the same name of Faraday's law. And um, I think this is kind of where a lot of people get confused. I found it, find it confusing because there are two different 
um, theoretical concepts that go by the same name of Faraday. So Faraday's name is associated with both um, laws of physics, if you will, or theories about what is the source of the EMF. Now, I'll talk a little bit about what Maxwell's um, uh, law of induction um, Faraday, Maxwell's law of induction doesn't really seem to be, have any experimental basis behind it. In other words, Maxwell doesn't um, say, okay, here are all these experiments that justify my uh, law of induction. And, uh, but Faraday did have a lot of experiments that sort of justified his flux cutting theory or his flux cutting rule. And um, so that's a, a difference between these two rules um, or two laws, if you want to call them that. Um, now let's go back to uh, what Maxwell's law. If you read his book, um, uh, the treatise on electricity and magnetism, he doesn't really go into a lot of he doesn't say, well, you know, these are the experiments that this law is based on. I, I talked about that earlier. He enunci enunciates a law and then gives an example of how the law is to be applied. And then later he uses the, um, you know, the two curl equations. The curl equation, one of them would be the Faraday curl equation which really wasn't Faraday's rule. It really is Maxwell's law. And I think the really the correct thing they should do is they should say, this is Maxwell's law of induction, not Faraday's law. And um, then he came up with this, uh, the law of displacement current, which is another curl equation. And those two become the foundational basis for EM wave theory, which is basically really the importance of, um, of Maxwell's theory. Maxwell's theory is the theory that allows us to predict electromagnetic waves. Okay, now talking about um, Weber. Okay, now apparently there are two Webers, and we're talking about Wilhelm Wel William Weber, Wilhelm Weber, I believe. And Weber has a two-fluid theory of, of electricity, and it's a relational um, theory of force. So um, the law is a relational theory in that you, it relates the velocity of the um, uh, elements of electricity. Um, and Weber did experiments on unipolar induction following Faraday, and I believe about 1850. And he uh, coined the name unipolar induction. So that's where we get this name unipolar induction from Weber's paper that he wrote about the phenomenon that had been explored previously by Faraday. Um, now, the point here to note is that Weber's theory doesn't really um, explain um, electromagnetic waves. And so when Hertz proved the existence of electromagnetic waves, and that would have been about 1880s or so, and then following Hertz's experiments, uh, Marconi was able to develop an actual practical system of wireless telegraphy. Um, you know, that pretty much... Uh, put Maxwell's theory um, above, uh, you know, that what Weber's theory basically sort of fell into um, disuse, but we'll see it's, it makes a comeback uh, later. Uh, okay. Now, um, so we have these two theories. Um, we have the Faraday theory that the lines of force are moving in a in the case of the unipolar induction. And I guess I didn't really describe the unipolar induction experiment very well. But what Faraday did was he took a cylindrical magnet and um, put it in a jar of mercury. And by 
making an elect electrical connection at the top of the magnet and with the mercury. Now the mercury goes up about halfway uh, towards the top of the magnet. So the mercury, uh, so you're really basically um, measuring the uh, current kind of at the middle of the magnet. That's important. And uh, when the magnet was turned uh, with the wire topping the touch uh, top of the magnet, and we're talking about an iron cylindrical magnet, and the magnet was rotated, there was a um, uh, production of electricity. Now, Weber investigated this uh, phenomenon. Now, um, the problem is that arises is if the uh, force cutting rule is correct, as according to Faraday, the problem arises that the flux lines are moving as the magnet is rotated and there's no cutting of the flux lines. So there, the flux lines are not passing across the conductive material of the circuit because the flux lines are rotating as the magnet is being moved. So the flux lines move with the movement of the magnet. And so the flux cutting rule basically doesn't seem to apply in this case. And Faraday resolved that problem by saying that the flux lines of the magnet are stationary and they don't move when the magnet moves. And so when the magnet is moved, the flux lines being stationary, that produces an EMF and a current is generated. Now, the... Um, Maxwell's uh, hypothesis would be that um, the um, circuit formed by the magnet, uh, the um, circuit goes from the top of the magnet to the galvanometer and the side of the magnet uh, to the galvanometer and, and, and the circuit is complete. Uh, oh, this guy is, that is so rotated or moved that cool. changes the flux that is intercepted by the circuit and so you don't really need in that case you don't need visible. the they didn't um, turn me on the lines of the magnet to rotate with the magnet okay that uh, the stationary, I'm sorry, the stationary hypothesis, hypothesis is not necessary, needed in the Maxwell theory. Okay, so this is important. The importance is for the Faraday theory to be correct, the flux lines of the magnet, when the magnet is rotated, um, are said to not move or to be stationary. But in the Maxwell theory, uh, the we don't need the flux lines to be stationary. We can have the flux lines move with the magnet in the Maxwell theory. So the basically the, the argument then becomes um, uh, which one of these two theories is correct. Okay. Um, the Maxwell theory or the Faraday theory. Um, and um uh, this became a big controversy towards the end of the 19th century. And uh, the net result of it was it depended upon uh, whether or not you thought the flux, the EMF, the flux intercepted external um, uh, wires of the circuit. So um, it turned out that this kind of becomes an ambiguous problem in that arguments could be made depending upon uh, your hypothesis of where the EMF is generated. Um, you can't really decide uh, which of the two theories is correct. Now, the next thing that happens is uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. And uh, Einstein sort of intervenes um, in 1905 in this controversy and by coming up with Einstein's theory of relativity. And in his paper, at the very beginning of his paper, he talks about the um, uh, problem of 
uh, whether or not the conductor is moving or the magnet is moving. And um, um, then later he mentions unipolar induction. <clears throat> And he says that this controversy of whether the lines are moving or not, it has no point. And I think that depends on the translation that you're reading. So in other words, Einstein sort of declares this issue of uh, whether the, the lines of magnetic flux are moving or not moving, or are actually rotating or not rotating with the magnet, is not really um, relevant. It has no point. It's it's. Uh, um, superseded by his uh, theory of relativity. And so um, this intervention of Einstein's theory of relativity becomes another issue that needs to be resolved. And that leads to Einstein's view, okay, um, that the problem of the four lines of force is, is really not important leads to the view that a lot of people express today that the lines of force and this idea of, of uh, magnetic fields and force lines is really kind of a fictitious uh, theory. And um, so we don't really need to resolve this idea of whether the force lines are stationary or are not stationary, whether they move with the magnet when the magnet is rotated or don't move with the magnet. That problem goes away if we um, take Einstein's theory of relativity and we apply that theory and uh, this issue no longer becomes important. And that kind of changes the whole um, um, historical development of resolving this controversy. Okay, so the controversy starts off with which law is the correct law, Faraday's law um, of the flux cutting rule, which um, implies that the lines of force are, are real. Okay, and then there's the Faraday law, which says that what really matters is the change in the total flux encompassed by the circuit. And um, we're still using the idea of a magnetic field in the, in the Faraday version. But Einstein comes along and now we're not really, um, we don't really need to decide which of these two laws is the correct law. Um, that kind of throws a curveball into the whole debate. And um, so you get a divergence of what people are working on. You get a number of people who start doing experiments, um, trying to prove Einstein's theory. And you have in the electrical engineering community, people arguing about the uh, Faraday um, Maxwell uh, laws, whether they're correct. Okay, now I want to point out here, um, uh, Minkowski, uh, Herman Minkowski, actually developed the Einstein theory, and Einstein really didn't pursue this um, after his 1905 paper, and so you you have a divergence there. So if you try to to um, um, really, it's a paper by Minkowski in 1907. That, that attempts to develop the relativistic theory of electromagnetic induction and unipolar um, uh, tries to explain the unipolar experiments based on the theory of relativity. And um, as I said, you have this controversy then that follows regarding the reality of the field lines. Okay, now I'm going to talk about, we'll shift gears here a little bit. Um, so we had, um, now we have three theories, okay? We have the Faraday theory, which is the flux cutting theory. We have the Maxwell theory, which is the um, flux rule, the change in the flux rule encompassed by the circuit. That would be the Maxwell rule or Maxwell's law. And then we, and we, and we have Einstein's uh, theory. So we have three theories. 
Um, <clears throat> and this is all in the period 19, around 1900 to 1910. Now, this uh, fellow Herring in 1908 came up with this, uh, well, calling here Herring's Paradox. And, and Herring was a practicing, practical electrical engineer. In other words, he was a guy that did practical work and he didn't really particularly care much for Maxwell's theory. So he decided that um, uh, Faraday's theory was the correct theory. And he came up with this experiment and um, uh, it's a little bit difficult to really understand, but if you move, if you here is figure one, if you have a horseshoe magnet and he's got this um, hand device, which is really a, um, a sliding circuit. You see here, it's like fle two flexible wires and um, they're connected to a galvanometer. And so when you move this circuit back and forth towards the North Pole, you get a reading on the galvanometer. See, he shows here, you get a reading. The galvanometer needle is pointing to the right. So yes, you get a, a voltage. Well, this is what you would expect from the Faraday law. Um, I mean, and I guess the Maxwell law. So both of the laws would give you this, this uh, correct, you get an EMF produced. So either the Maxwell law or the Faraday law uh, would predict that you'd get a galvanometer reading. Okay, now on figure two, uh, if you slip the measuring device, this uh, uh, device with the handle downward across the pole of the magnet, the north pole of the magnet, you slip it down across, you get no EMF whatsoever. Nothing is recorded on the, on the galvanometer at all. And Herring interpreted this to mean that this was a violation of the Maxwell flux uh, law or flux linking law. And he basically thought that the Maxwell law was incorrect and that this experiment that he showed here proved that it was incorrect. So this gets, so now we're into people are producing experiments that appear to refute the Maxwell law. And now here's another famous um, paradox that appears to refute the Maxwell law. And this call, this appears in uh, Feynman's um, um, second volume of Feynman's uh, lectures. And this is called the rocking plate paradox. And the idea here is you have these two copper plates and they're rock, you move them back and forth. They're moving uh, backwards and forwards. And the idea is that the flux enclosed by this circuit, there's a magnetic field, the magnetic field is perpendicular to this diagram. You see here, he shows X, the magnetic field B, if you can see that. Okay, so the rocking back and forth causes the um, area enclosed by the circuit can, the, uh, to change because the plates have a contact here at the towards the bottom. And then as you rock them, the path through which the flux passes moves um, upwards in this diagram. And so that is a change. Oops, uh, I did it again. That anyway, that produces a change in the flux in the circuit, but there's no e there's no measured EMF and there's no measured current. So that's another. Uh, paradox that would appear to refute Maxwell's flux changing rule. Okay. Um, now we're back to relativity again. Um, <laughs> was unipolar induction critical to relativity? Now, um, A.I. Miller says, yes, it is. Um, and it has to be um, this is kind of a questionable thing as to whether or not unipolar induction is crucial relativity. Now, why are we talking about this? Well, people have uh, tried to uh, do experiments that say 
Um, I've disproved relativity by doing experiments on unipolar induction. And um, a number of people have done that. I think this slide is out of order, but I'll talk about that anyway, if it's not confusing to people. Um, so if indeed we believe that the unipolar induction phenomenon is crucial to relativity, then unipolar inductions could be considered um, uh, to disprove relativity. And um, Franco, Francisco Miller claims that the experiments disprove special relativity. And we also have JC, Wesley, and Kelly. Okay, so um, what's really the crux of, of this? This is, has to do with the um, um, Faraday paradox. Okay, so um, what is this Faraday paradox? Where, where does this come from? Now, if we go to the, um, I'm going to kind of see if I can move over here to, um, Okay. Uh, it's not showing up here. Can you see this uh, new slide? There's been a different one. Do I need to, to share here? Yes, but a, a little echo has come back, Harry. I'm not sure if it's because you're too close to the Can mic. Can you hear me? It was fine a moment ago. Yeah. Excuse me? Uh, yeah, yeah, it just All deteriorated. Right. Do you there, see the, the yeah, unipolar? Right. Okay, Fer do you see this Faraday's law of induction? Do you see this yes, page it, here it, that I'm showing? Yes, we is yes, it sharing? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. so, all right, this is the Wikipedia page where they try to explain Faraday's law of induction, and they kind of don't really do a great job of explaining the difference between the Maxwell law and the Faraday law. But here's the crucial point here. And um, if, you, if anybody who's interested in this, um, this is a, a really good example of, uh, they kind of present the issues, but it's not really as clear as you would like. But anyway, down towards the bottom, they say exceptions, okay? exceptions. Okay, why, you know, Wikipedia is talking about a law of physics, and here are exceptions, exceptions to a law of physics. How can you call a law of physics a law if there is exceptions to it? And there are two exceptions. There's the um, Faraday's homopolar generator, which is the Faraday unipolar generator, and then there's the rocking plates paradox. Now, I actually added in the herring paradox as another um, example. They don't consider the herring paradox to be uh, an exception to the Faraday law, okay, but they do consider the uh, Faraday unipolar um, problem, the disk, the rotating disk, the Faraday rotating disk experiments to be um, the Faraday paradox, and that that would be an exception to the Faraday law of induction, which presumably is the Maxwell's law of induction. So if this is true, this, um, you know, if these really are exceptions, okay, if, if a paradox is really disproves Maxwell's theory, um, that's not very good uh, because Maxwell's theory, I mean, uh, the Maxwell's Faraday law is implemented as a curl equation in, in the theory, um, you know, del cross E equals the partial derivative of the magnetic induction with respect to time. 
okay, that's uh, that's fundamental to the theory of electromagnetic waves. If this law isn't true, then um, you know we no longer have a theory of electromagnetic waves. So that's that's kind of not really great. <laughs> All right. All right. Or we're back to the Faraday paradox. Um, you see this, Ann? Is this working here now? It, it, it is working now, Harry. Yes, Faraday paradox. Okay, we got the Faraday paradox. Okay, so um, this is a sort of a diagram of the rotating disk. Now, you see here the diagram shows that the disk is, is rotating. Okay, we have a circuit that's formed here. You see, you see the circuit. And the idea is that V cross B, and here's where the problem lies. What is this V cross B? And it turns out there are two ways to interpret V cross B. One of them would be um, that the V cross B produces a force on electrons in the disk as it's crossing the magnetic lines of force according to what we call today the Lorentz force law. So we have electrons in this disk that are caused to go into motion by this V cross v, B force. And that would be the Faraday flux cutting rule interpretation. Or we can have the idea that the V cross B is due to a change in the um, uh, virtual area of the circuit. So V cross B tells us the change in flux. Okay. It tells us V cross B is a calculation of the change in flux. So we can use V cross B to mean two different things, a force on the electrons in the disc that are forcing the electrons to go around the circuit. So the EMF would be produced in the disc. Okay. Or we can interpret this as being a change in the flux that occurs in the complete circuit. Okay. Now, in that case, um, it's not real clear whether um, where the EMF is supposed to be produced. Is the EMF produced just in the one part of the disk? Well, you could look at it that way if you want to. Um, or is the... Um, um, force on the electron due to the to the Lorentz force law. Now, essentially, what we have here is um, two different two different interpretations as to how the um, physics is to be uh, interpreted. And we're back to the paradox, if you will, if you want to call it a paradox, of uh, that there are two theories. Now, um, <clears throat> some people claim that the uh, relativistic theory can also um, explain this. I don't find the relativistic uh, theory to be quite as convincing because um, the relativistic theory has to do with the um, motion of the magnet through space. Um, creates an electric field in space. And this particular experiment, I don't think basically fits that description very well. So we still have this, <clears throat> excuse me, but people who studied this, you know, they claim that the uh, special theory of relativity uh, meets the experimental, um, satisfies the experimental results. And so we still have the three theories. Okay. <clears throat> I want to talk about superconductivity. Now, why, why do I want to talk about superconductivity? Well, it's interesting that the superconductivity effect was discovered about the same time, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that the um, Einstein came up with this theory Okay, the Einstein's theory was 1905. I think superconductivity was um, a few years later. Uh, Onez discovered, um, was able to make uh, um, zero resistance um, 
occur by reducing the temperatures. <clears throat> and um, wasn't long after that. Now, remember, these all occurring pretty much about the same time. Einstein's theory of relativity in 1905, Herring with his paradox in 1908. And then and now we have uh, the superconductivity coming into the issue. And uh, what they were able to do was to prove that the resistance was zero by inducing, using electromagnetic induction to um, produce a persistent current in um, a coil of wire that was uh, superconducting. So, so what we have is a, super a circuit with zero resistance Electromagnetic induction is produced in that circuit, and it's not transient, okay? The current continues on forever. So now you might want to know how did they induce the current in the, mat, in, the, in the coil, and what was done was that you place a magnet next to a coil that's in the... Um, um, flask, I guess you'd call it, that's super cooled. So in other words, you have, I'm not sure whether they used helium or what the, um, what it used to cool the um, uh, uh, circuit. But when the magnet, when you cooled the mag, when you cooled the circuit in the presence of the magnet and then removed the magnet from the vicinity of the circuit, there is a change in flux through the circuit. That would be Faraday's law. And the and you had this a persistent current. Uh, in other words, this electric current was created um, by electromagnetic induction, and it didn't die out and remained remained for for a long period of time. In some of the experiments, these these persistent currents lasted for years until they decided to stop, stop the experiment. Okay, now we have the problem that if an EMF is involved, um, you know, if the, an EMF is produced by the electromagnetic induction, according to Ohm's law, uh, the current should be infinite, but we don't have infinite current. Okay, we have a, a, a definite uh, current. Now, in my opinion, this presents a problem if you believe that um, the electromagnetic force is produced by um, electromagnetic induction, the change in the flux in the circuit. And if you believe that the change in the flux causes an, a, an EMF or an electric field force, then you have to um, face the issue of how is this possible if the resistance is zero, that should produce an infinite current, not a finite current. So I looked into this for, um, you know, I studied superconductivity and read everything I could, and I really couldn't find any real uh, good answers to this. Um, now, then there's the other issue of the levitation of magnets. And I, this is a familiar demonstration on on the internet and videos on the internet where a magnet is suspended upon, uh, uh, above a superconducting disc. Okay. Now in this particular case, there's no relative motion required to maintain the currents because the disc, the magnet is suspended above the disc. Okay. Magnet suspended above the disc. The magnet's not moving up and down. It's not moving right to left. It's completely stationary. So the uh, in this case, there's no um, transient effect of the um, uh, magnetic field. So in other words, uh, there's no change in the flux or there's no flux cutting uh, of the circuit of the disk that would induce these currents. So um, there's nothing to the, the effect isn't transient at all. Okay, so we have no, <clears throat> so that would imply that the, um, both the Faraday rule and the Faraday flux cutting rule and the, the um, um, Maxwell 
uh, flux change rule or are, are both incorrect. That's, and I really never was able to really resolve that particular issue. And that kind of says maybe we don't need an EMF. Okay. Um, and if we kind of agree with this conclusion, then um, we have, we probably need a new theory of, um, of electromagnetic induction. If, if we have a, if we think that uh, an EMF is not involved in uh, the production of the magnetic field or the induced magnetic field, if you will. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, um, some other experiments that, that bear on this issue that you probably don't hear too much about. And uh, one of these would be the first one is uh, relating to the um, special relativity. Now, Cramp and Nor Norgrove did this experiment in which they took a cylindrical magnet um, and spun this cylindrical magnet, okay? And then they uh, tried to detect the electrical field of the spinning magnet. Now, according to relativity, um, the motion of the magnetic field should be associated with the production of an electric field. And um, if you believe the relativity theory and the uh, Faraday theory, if you had a... Um, piece of wire um, that was placed near the spinning magnet, that should uh, cause the uh, wire um, to become electrified, that you should, it, it should have a plus charge at one end and a minus charge at the other end, because the mo motion of the magnetic field should produce an electric field. And that's basically what um, you would get from the theory of relativity uh, as a result of the Lorentz transform. Now, uh, there's an argument in the literature about whether or not you need special relativity or general relativity to, pr to predict this effect. And I think the uh, uh, conclusion is that, um, well, you need general relativity because you're talking about rotation. But the bottom line is there's no detection. Uh, nobody has really detected. Uh, well, Cramp and Norgrove, Norgrove didn't detect an electric field as a result of the spinning magnet. So that's kind of a disc that sort of tends to um, argue against special relativity and the Faraday uh, flux cutting uh, theory. Um, here's a more uh, decisive uh, experiment or result, and that is that when the magnet is turning, there's no torque on the magnet. So in other words, um, there's no um, reverse EMF or torque on the magnet. Um, and we would expect that in the unipolar gen generator that the magnet um, if the magnet is supplying the energy that is converted um, from mechanical energy to electrical energy, if that energy is coming from the magnet, then the motion of the magnet sh should be supplying the mechanical energy and there should be a torque, uh, reverse torque on the magnet as a result of that. Um, and that's pretty much a principle of electrical engineering that you get that you get a, a torque in opposition when when a motor is running and <clears throat> so when when you place a load on a generator it starts working harder to produce electricity because of this um, reaction torque that occurs in the motor and this torque isn't detected as appearing on the magnet so that implies that the in the unipolar induction, the magnet motion doesn't does not the magnet motion does not provide the uh, energy that is that is converted into electricity. 
Um, then we have the other, another aspect of it is no experiment can specifically locate the seat of the EMF. And this turns out to be a bit controversial. Um, you know, what, is, what, is, what do you mean by seat of EMF? Okay, now if we go back to the um, controversy about does the field rotate or not rotate with the magnet, um, people claim that the proponent, uh, uh, if you take the uh, Maxwellian view, okay, um, you could say that there's EMF produced and um, um, the wires that connect to the circuit. In other words, the EMF is not necessarily produced in the disc that's rotating or the rotating magnet. It's produced in the wires that connect to the galvanometer. So you have to have these wires that connect to the generator, the magnet that's spinning or the disc that's spinning. And the EMF can be produced in that part of the circuit. And so um, the argument was we, could, we can't really resolve which of the, um, whether the field lines are rotating or not rotating because we need to know where the seat of the EMF is. And, um, Faraday had pretty much decided that there wasn't any induction in the wires that connected to the disc or the magnet that's rotating. And so this really shouldn't be an issue, but, but um, it's still an issue and people are still talking about it. Okay. Now we had the third pro the last problem here, which is Al Kelly, I think was one of the first people to kind of really strongly argue this. And that is that um, he tried to do some experiments that showed that the field did rotate with the, when he rotated the, the magnet. And so um, uh, he maintained that the field did rotate with the magnet. And therefore um, that would resolve the controversy of whether the, which law is correct. So if we could actually uh, ascertain which, uh, whether the field is rotating with the magnet or not rotating with the magnet. Um, we can, we can make a decisive, um, argument that, um, that definitely, um, refutes or disproves the Faraday, um, uh, theory. And, um, but, Al Kelly, I don't think really basically wanted to do that. I think he felt that the, that the Faraday theory was the correct theory. And um, so that kind of leaves you with a kind of a contradiction, I think, um, with respect to what Al Kelly was trying to say. Okay. So now I guess we're getting to the meat of really what um, I'm talking about here. And that is in science, your objective is um, you want to eliminate theories. You want to disprove theories. Um, and so what we have here, we have too many theories. Okay, so how many theories do we have, actually? We have the Faraday flux cutting theory. We have Maxwell's um, flux change rule theory. Uh, rule. We have Einstein's theory of relativity. And we have Weber's theory. Okay, so that's four theories. Um, which one of them is the correct theory? Um, and at the present time, there's really nobody um, can come up with a um, convincing argument um, that's been accepted in science as to which of the four theories is correct. So we have four theories and we don't know which one of them is correct or if any of them are correct, as I pointed out with the superconductive conductivity uh, difficulty, all of them may be wrong um, because they all try to identify that an EMF is produced uh, in electromagnetic uh, induction. So maybe they're all wrong and we need something else. Um, <clears throat> now, I, I tend to think that if we go with the hypothesis that the field does rotate with the magnet, 
Um, and it looks like if you do, if you, one of the, I forgot, I didn't mention the video where they use uh, ferrofluid. Ferrofluid is a uh, fluid that uh, contains um, ferric material in it that responds to the magnetic field. And in this video, uh, you can see that if you rotate the magnet, the uh, ferrofluid doesn't remain static. Okay, it changes. And um, so it looks like the field lines are actually rotating. So um, I sort of think that that convinces me, it might not convince other people, but that convinces me that the lines, the lines of force of the magnetic field do rotate with the magnet. Now, if we accept that hypothesis, okay, then um, that means we can pretty much lim eliminate three of the four theories that and uh, rely on relative motion. Okay, and what are those theories? The one would be would be the Faraday flux cutting theory. Okay, because that's only works if you say the um, lines are stationary. So the experiments that Faraday did, he had to conclude that the field lines don't rotate with the magnet in order to uh, explain his experimental results. But if the field lines do rotate with the magnet, that kind of eliminates his theory. And um, it also eliminates relative motion theories that rely on the motion of the magnetic field. And what are those theories? There's the Einstein's theory and Weber's theory. So we start off with four theories. And if we accept the hypothesis that the field lines do rotate with the magnet, then we can reduce these four theories down to one, which would be the Maxwell theory. Now, um, I also gave some other um, evidence that suggests that the uh, Maxwell theory is correct in the um, fact that there was no um, magnetic field detected uh, when the magnet is spinning. Okay, that tends to argue against the uh, Einstein and the relational theories. And um, the fact that there's no torque observed on the magnet when the magnet is spinning. Okay, so um, if, if we accept this um, idea that the field lines do rotate with the magnet, then, then we can reduce the uh, conclusion down to that the, there's only one theory left, and that would be Maxwell's theory, okay? And, um, but the difficulty is that um, people don't really want to accept the idea that um, uh, we, we can reduce it down to one theory. Um, this is kind of a surprise here. So, um, um, certainly the people who advocate special relativity don't want to accept the idea that their theory could be refuted by experimental evidence. So that's certainly not something that, uh, that would be uh, acceptable to them. Um, the uh, proponents of Weber, Weber's theory have seized upon the unipolar induction experiments because of the fact that they uh, produce uh, paradoxes, or it's believed to produce paradoxes, that if we um, can uh, resolve this confusion by Weber's theory, then that would uh, uh, be a feather in the cap for Weber, Weber's theory. So in recent years, last 20 years, that's there have been a lot of people that have done experiments on unipolar induction, which promote that view. Um, the other issue is that... Um, uh, people say, well, this whole idea of whether the field rotates or not, the existence of field lines, um, that's a meaningless, um, that's a meaningless problem. And of course that 
um, hypothesis and that viewpoint was promoted by, uh, well, started by Einstein, so to speak. And um, so there are a lot of people who, who basically are still um, in, in that camp. And <clears throat> so what we have is essentially um, ambiguous experimental evidence. Um, we have four different theories. Um, we have uh, people who uh, argue about the metaphysical aspects um, of whether or not the field concept is real or not real. Um, and um, that sort of is promoted by the relativity um, uh, proponents. So we don't really have a, a resolution of this problem. Okay, so kind of my view is that um, we should be able to resolve this based on um, what the experiment is, what the evidence is. And my view is that the best theory is the Maxwell theory. Now, um, want to if we want to go back to the um, Herring's paradox. So we talked about Herring's paradox. Okay, Herring's paradox. Remember, Herring, this has a resolution. Okay, um, this has been solved um, and been explained. So this is not really a um, this is not really a paradox actually anymore. It's been uh, resolved. Um, the rocking plates uh, paradox um, of Feynman. Um, this is pretty easy to resolve, and um, the plates. One plate is moving clockwise and the other plate, here's the one, the one on the right is moving clockwise, the one on the left is moving counterclockwise. Okay, so you see that they're rotating about a point of movement. So one's moving clockwise, the other's moving counterclockwise. The EMF that is generated are opposite. So you have an EMF generated and uh, positive and for the clockwise motion and an EMF negative for the counterclockwise. So you wouldn't expect to get an EMF in this particular situation. So that paradox doesn't apply. So that leaves us with um, the um, Faraday paradox, the, um, uh, you, what, the unipolar induction problem. And um, it's pretty well agreed in the literature that um, the Maxwell's theory um, can explain or is consistent with the experimental results. So the Faraday theory passes all of these tests, if you will. So it's been thoroughly challenged and investigated, and the Maxwell theory uh, does appear to survive all of the challenges that have been put up before it. Um, okay. Um, so we have that the paradoxes that have been uh, claimed to refute the Maxwell theory turn out the the uh, counter evidence turns out to really not be correct. Um, then we have um, people who are proponents of these different theories. I kind of doubt that proponents of special relativity are going to uh, agree that uh, any um, experiments or conclusions drawn from experiments in electromagnetic induction disprove their theory, uh, despite the fact that um, uh, there have been a lot of claims uh, that this is the case, um, I kind of doubt that they're going to accept that. So there's resistance to the acceptance, acceptance of that idea. Um, and then we have the, um, um, 
the more experiments that people do, they doesn't seem to um, really resolve or bring in, bring the controversy to a conclusion as to which is the correct law that it ought to be used. And we're not moving uh, in in the direction of of eliminating um, theories where the experiments that people are doing are basically keeping the number of theories that um, uh, they're saying that the theories, all the theories are are um, uh, consistent with all of the experiments. So there's no elimination of, of theories going on here. Um, and so we have all these theories and uh, different interpretations of, of the experimental evidence and not any, but not any um, elimination of any of the theories or res resolution of the controversy. So we have here basically a problem that um, this application of the scientific method doesn't seem to be working in this play, in this particular instance. And that seems to be the crux of the issue that, that um, the scientific method can't really resolve or eliminate or falsify, I think is the technical word. So we, they're not using the scientific method to falsify experiments. So, you know, here, here's one of the problems. When you do an experiment, um, uh, there's kind of a weakness of the, of the uh, experimental or the inductive part of, of science. And that is when you do an experiment, that doesn't necessarily mean that people have to believe your results. <laughs> I mean, people argue about this. Um, you need repeatable experiments. Well, in this particular, what we start off with in this controversy is um, people didn't believe the results that Faraday came up with. And a lot of people um, in the 19th century were doing the repeating these unipolar induction experiments and kind of getting the same results. So the experiments were repeated over and over and over again. And um, you would assume that would be convincing and lead to some result, but it doesn't really, in this particular case, we're not really moving towards a resolution of, of the, uh, what the results are, uh, we're not eliminating any theories. We're not, um, we're not moving towards a definition of what theories are incorrect and what theories are correct. So um, we don't really have a good um, experiment that falsifies um, any of these theories. Now I've mentioned uh, a couple of ex experiments that I think do falsify the theory, but it seems that they are not really, um, people really not accepting that. Um, in science today, most of the work is being done using deduction. So um, in this particular story that I've tried to tell, I hope that it's clear to you. Um, we start off with, um, Thomas Jefferson extolling the virtues of observation and experiment. And then uh, Faraday, who is essentially the penal ultimate experimenter, very thorough and very careful. He investigates um, very many different, uh, does the experiments in different ways and, and repeats them over and over again. He's very thorough. And um, um, when contrast that approach to uh, Maxwell's approach, which is the uh, mathematical deductive approach. And um, the deductive approach or the mathematical approach to me has the problem that is mathematics physical reality? There seems to be an assumption behind it that, that somehow or another mathematics is physical reality. And I, I don't really believe that 
uh, hypothesis at all. And part of the reason is that mathematics is, you can invent a lot. If you, if you study mathematics, you'll find out that they have what are called axiomatic systems. And so if you have different axioms, you get different theorems, okay? And so depending upon what your axioms that you choose, you can get a different mathematics. So um, that means that we have to know what the axioms or the assumptions are. We have to know which ones are correct in science to make this deductive method work. And the idea is we're going to test these assumptions with experiments. But here I've shown that um, experiments really can't, are really as effective as we would like to think they are in eliminating theories and telling us which axioms we should or should not be using. So we're faced with this problem that experiments can be ambiguous and not really lead us to the answer. Okay. Um, having said all that, thrown in some philosophy, um, I'm going to sort of end up here with uh, um, where, uh, where can we go with this? How, how can we, um, what approach can we take to resolve the difficulty? And the difficulty is, um, the scientific community has decided that all of the theories are acceptable. Um, all the, the, the theories that we talked about here, the, uh, they're all is, they're all fine and, um, that they can't really, um, resolve which one of them is correct. So they're, so that's the, um, that's the solution. Um, all the theories are good. Um, it doesn't really help us resolve the, the issues that, that I've talked about. Um, so um, my idea is that um, we should take a, a different approach, an engineering approach. And that would be um, essentially asking the question, um, how does the energy um, get transferred from the mechanical energy or power. I don't like to use the word energy. I prefer to use power because power is energy times time. And what we normally see is we see energy um, in transformation, if you will. And that shows up as power or transfer. So energy being transferred or moving from one place to another is power. So what we have is and this uh, Faraday um, and all this electromagnetic induction, what we have is a transformation of mechanical power uh, motion, and that becomes electrical power in the circuit. And so we have a transformation uh, from mechanical to electrical power. And um, what that implies is that maybe... Um, I think that the uh, Maxwell theory fits this model better than the other theories do. Okay. Um, so we want to ask, how does this mechanical energy become electrical energy? Well, I don't really think any of the theories really help us there. And perhaps maybe a new theory is needed. So that's what I'm suggesting. And, um, that may, this new theory that we're talking about, may um, require that we sort of dispense with this idea of electricity as electrons moving inside of wires. Because if we have this idea here that electrons have to be put into motion by an EMF, um, we run into difficulties. And um, I've talked about the difficult, one of the difficulties is in the superconducting problem. And um, the other difficulty is that um, the Lorentz force law doesn't really work 
and um, and the cases that we would like to. It, it appears to be refuted by the the uh, unipolar induction experiment. So we can't rely on the idea that there's a force uh, being exerted on the electrons inside the wires by the um, relative motion of the wire and the magnetic field. This idea here doesn't seem to really work. And um, so we sort of may not really need this idea of the electron, the EMF and electricity is being uh, produced by motion of electrons inside the wires. That's uh, kind of uh, my take on it because I don't really believe that much in the electron theory. So what that means is we may need that we can maybe can possibly um, get rid of this EMF concept. And that seems to be uh, really where a lot of the problem is coming from. And that is uh, if you have, if you need this EMF to exert a force on electrons, then your theory has to be able to explain how this uh, mechanism of the creation of the EMF that puts the electrons into motion occurs. But there seems to be a big, a lot of difficulty in actually um, establishing experimentally how this uh, process is occurring. And um, the experiments kind of lead us into conclusion, into confusion and um, contradictions. And um, so probably maybe the best thing to do would be we needed a theory that doesn't rely upon EMF and, uh, and the production of EMF in order to generate a current. Okay, so that kind of ends my talk. I'd like to say something. Um who is that? Eric Ryder. Oh, okay, I'll try to bring you up now. Um, right, go ahead, Eric. It doesn't seem that complicated to me. <clears throat> uh, if you were to have a magnet underneath... Who is this that's uh, talking? Eric Ryder. Hello. <laughs> All right. Let's let's just say you have a magnet underneath a, a coil or a disc or whatever. You spin the magnet. This has been done many times where people spin the magnet around its axis. And there's not going to be any uh, voltage read across a coil or a disc or whatever you put here. Because there's not any magnetic field that's changing. The Maxwell's law is about changing magnetic field. But if you spin the magnet, the magnetic field is, is static. Now, if you want, the problem is using the lines. People think that the lines are stuck onto the magnet somehow. Maxwell's law does not do that. Maxwell's law is about the changing magnetic field. So that's, that's one thing to understand. It's, what's going on here is not about Maxwell's law of induction. It's about the Lorentz law. So let me finish. Uh, so so this, this we just know from simple experiments. Many people have done that experiment. You can see them on YouTube. It's easy to do, except if you spin the magnet, just be careful you don't just put it in a lathe that has steel around here that'll wiggle the field. So you just keep the field where, where the, the magnetic field is a constant. And then you can eliminate what's going on as far as whether it's uh, Maxwell's law of induction, because the magnetic field is constant. And you could do the opposite also. You could try to see if there's a torque on the magnet itself. So, so, uh, so do you have any um, take yourself on this, Eric? Yes, I do. What is it? Well, I'll get to it. I'm just okay. one step if at a time. you could be brief, please, because we don't have well, very much time. Well, one step at a time. Okay. Yeah. So, so it the the way the way to see this is uh, to use the Lorentz force law. There's nothing wrong with the Lorentz force law. That's what works in our cathode ray tubes and a whole list of experiments. And I've done it as well. So, 
if you have a disc and uh, you put a magnet underneath it, the magnet is, is, is that, so there's this north, south, you spin the disc. So there's gonna be charges that are moving. So you can use, you, you know the velocity of, of uh, the charges and uh, using, uh, this is the Lorentz force law, charge, velocity, cross product with B, or just simplify it if you like. But <clears throat> what you end up with is that there are going to be forces on the charges. I'll just use Q for charges. That if you put a brush here to pick it up, the, the charges are going to be pushed to one side of the disk by the Lorentz force law. And that's similar to what I just explained that the experiments don't verify that Lorentz force law. That's the problem. There are other there are you're other telling me you're, you're telling me that the experiments do when they don't. So you basically prove no, my no, thesis. No, no, no. Look, there are people who've my done thesis. this. Excuse me. Excuse me. I'm the I was the presenter here. Um, my thesis is that People like you are what perpetuate the confusion because you insist that a certain theory is correct, even well, though experiments the experiments don't correct. really support that theory. Well, I, look, I, yeah, I'm sorry, there, but there there I, I just was trying to clarify, that. Eric. Um, do you um, accept right. the Maxwell theory or, or the Faraday expression of that? Or do you think that the Lorentz force law explains everything? Just want a clarification there, what your position is. You use you use the Maxwell's theory when the uh, strength of the magnetic field changes, but this is not that case. I was just trying to show it. This is a case where there's a velocity of charges moving in a magnetic field, and then you get to use the Lorentz force law. There's nothing wrong with the Lorentz force law. It's been used in all it's it's used regularly, like in their cathode ray tubes. That's how it works. It's the same thing. So oh, okay, well, I, I think this is something we're going to have to come back to because we're going to be discussing this subject for another couple of sessions, and obviously that that's an interesting point about the Lorentz uh, force law being maybe general. Um, perhaps if well, somebody no. else, would be, sorry, how would you like to come back, Harry, before we go to somebody else? The real Say issue again. is that that law doesn't apply in the case of unipolar induction. That's the whole point of the controversy. The controversy is that there's no relative motion between the charges and the magnetic field, and therefore there can be no EMF. That's not the way the Lorentz force law works. The the Lorentz force law is about charges <laughs> moving in a. In you're a proving my case. You're, no, you're proving no. my argument that the scientific no, no, method no. fails in this no, particular no. case. Look, just look at a television. You're proving set. my argument. Just look at a, a cathode ray tube television set has a static magnetic field, and there be charges moving across it, and the and the charges will be forced to one side. You don't need to have. A, a you're, not talking, you're not talking about electrons moving in a vacuum in a, in a CRT. It's similar. We're not talking it's, about it's that. It's a similar it's case. You have to... charges moving. All in right. So your argument field. is. All right. You're proving uh, my case. My case is no, that you can't no. resolve this issue because of all the different conflicting opinions that you have. No, it's, it, it's a We're not applying scientific method. We're just arguing. Yeah, uh, from my yeah, humble you're thought, you're not applying. I, I, I might say, uh, gentlemen, that, that you're form. both right in certain circumstances. Now, I may be, for my part, um, uh, proposing a more general uh, uh, law of electromagnetic induction, which indicates that in certain cases, um, what Eric says is, is so, and in other cases, um, Harry's description. But we, we really need to have a more general law. I, I, I don't think there's anything concerned with, you know, being right and wrong. Um, but uh, 
if I could leave it there, because we don't have very much time, but we'll have to come back to this. Thanks very much for your contribution, Eric. Um, is there anybody else in the green room who, who'd like to come in at this stage? Um, let me just see. Can I? Don't know if I can get rid of that there. Um, uh, would Bob like to say anything, or does he want to save all his own thunder until um, perhaps next week? I want to thank Harry for his presentation. And I really like uh, that he's bringing up uh, an issue about the scientific method. And I think that it can, uh, there is a problem in science and uh, taking a look at uh, scientific experimental results and then using those to weed out certain theories. I don't have a particular solution to the you know, these issues. Um, but I, I want to thank Harry for raising them. Uh, thank you. Oh, okay, well, thank you very much. Um, um, I, I'll, I'll summarize, actually, uh, just before we, we finish. But um, is anybody else um, in the green room? Or just before we come to that, I'll just go very briefly through the comments here. Um, most of them are, are, are just general. But, um, for example, uh, Toby Grotz here says something about this person who showed many times using Faraday homopolar generators that increased loads did not result in increased loads in the drive motor. Has this been seen elsewhere? Now, I, I'm not familiar with, with that. Uh, Harry, have any comments on that comment? Yeah, I talked about that. Um, that's the, uh, the uh, magnet, the rotation of the magnet can't be the source of the energy that's being produced, uh, the electrical energy that's being produced. The electrical energy that's being produced is the rotation of the disc. It's the mechanical, it, you're rotating the disc or the magnet, okay? And, uh, well, that's where it's confusing. In, in the case of unipolar induction, the magnet and the disc are the same, okay? And then, um, in the disc case, the disc is rotating and the magnet can be either stationary or moving. The disc rotating in the disc experiment, the mechanical force of rotating the disc is what produces the electrical energy. The rotation of the magnet doesn't have any effect on the, that production of energy at all. So, okay. Yeah, the, 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 that's, that, that, that's the position you've put forward, indeed. The, the other one here, uh, I, I don't know if it's relevant, but uh, it, it seems to be whether the Earth's uh, magnetic field would, has any influence on this. And Michael Clark, have persistent currents uh, been tested uh, at the North and uh, South Pole as seen from at the equator to see if there are differences? So possibly the experimental location he's suggesting. I, I don't know if that's relevant, Harry. I, I don't know how to effects. react to that. The, um, the issue with the um, persistent currents is that what they've done, apparently, this is my, I couldn't find any, when I looked at superconductivity and I looked at this many years ago, I couldn't really find where they addressed this issue. Um, essentially, superconductivity is sort of its own uh, physical phenomenon of physics. And so they don't really try to relate superconductivity to traditional electromagnetic theory. And so they're in two different, uh, complete separate areas. And they have a theory that explains everything that happens in superconductivity. I think it's the BCS theory. And that theory is not necessarily connected to traditional electromagnetism and and so you don't really see this brought up. Um, okay. Um, I don't know if Franklin is putting up through these comments. Um, Harry, if there was a theory and new experiments, what forum would they use to convey those ideas? Well, you have to decide, um, you know, whether this I think forum. That's is what we're doing here. Yeah, quite <laughs> so. I, I don't know if you might want to publish as well. There was one other um, comment, I think, from, from Dennis here about um, have you looked at um, uh, what did he call it? Open circuits, you know, where maybe a dipole would just have a, 
a feed in the center or, or these sort of whip antennas. Uh, have, have you looked at that, Harry? No, I'm not really sure what he's... Um, essentially, if you believe in this flux cutting uh, theory, um, the rotation of the magnet theory, as, as Eric was talking about, he was trying to promote that. The, um, if you believe in that theory and you, and you accept that theory, then there ought to be an electric uh, field um, detected when you, let's say, for instance, if you have a, a, a wire, okay, and you place it next to uh, a spinning magnet, that should basically have an electric field across it. She should have plus charges at one end and negative charges at the other end, and there should be a detectable electromet, a detectable voltage. But the experiments don't show that. Okay. Um, well, uh, does anybody else from the green room wish it to would be, It would be. I have a question. Who's have that? Question. This Who's is that? Uh, this is Robert Kemp. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. I, I'll, I'll put you up now, Robert. Um, very well. Go ahead. Um, you, um, you don't have the video. I haven't yes. heard from you in a while. Yes. Hello, Harry. How's it going? Um, my, my question to you in that list of, um, I guess they could be called experiments or your list of different theories that you're trying to eliminate down to one, if possible, or two, as uh, Ian was mentioning. Um, but, but my question to you is, you never mentioned Lentz's law. Why was in your study you not mentioned Lentz's law, which is... Okay. Um. Yes, um, I probably should have, but he doesn't really have a theory about the, um, he doesn't have a theory about electromagnetic induction. He just, he just says, this is how we determine the direction of the current. And um, so, uh, you know, there, I, I really didn't want to get into that issue as uh, it, it gives more complications. I don't think Lenz's law is really a theory of how the EMF is produced, if you will. Because Lenz's law should give you, if current is being produced somewhere, there's a magnetic field present. And you have to have that if you have motion from either your disk or your magnet. It's interesting, I think, that uh, Bill Lucas has on a number of occasions mentioned Lenz's Law and um, yes. the lack of including it in, in the list of equations which are solved in um, in collaboration with Maxwell's equations or indeed it, taking it to be one of the, those equations. Um, but but maybe it's, it's just an energy thing. It's just a, a reactive um, a point as well. Um, I'm just wondering, James Keane, would you well, like to I say think the issue here is... Who, who's that? Could you wave your hand if you wish to um, speak so I can put you up? Because otherwise we're going to get uh, just a load of people speaking. Uh, James, would you... Could, yeah, I'm going to put James up now, um, if I can. Okay, uh, can you Go hear ahead, me? James. Yes, can hear you perfectly. Uh, wonderful. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Harry, for the wonderful pre presentation. I'd like to just pick up, if I may, briefly on uh, your uh, uh, conclusions toward the end, particularly about how axioms uh, affect results uh, that you may get uh, mathematically or otherwise, I guess, uh, in the experiments that one might wish to design. Uh, the basic axiom in all of these theories the four that you talk about is continuous space time. And uh, in the physics literature, there's a whole lot of um, people talking about discrete steps in either space or time. Uh, and uh, my work results, quantizes space and time. And I just like to connect that with 
Harry's final conclusions that maybe we need to look at the the mother of all axioms, that, which is continuous space time. And if that is uh, faulty, it, it means that none of the four theories are correct. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there in case there's any more co comments. Thank you. Okay, th thank you, uh, James. H Harry, any comments? Well, I'm not really, <laughs> you know, um, I guess we basically have to live with, um, um, you know, what we think we know. I, I don't. I don't really know um, how to, you know, implement a theory that would really deal with that axiom. Um, I agree. I agree, hidden in there as an axiom. Um, space is, you know, when you, you do integration um, with Maxwell's. Theory. Maxwell's theory is is essentially um, a theory of continuous mathematics. Um, you know, the calculus is continuous, and so that definitely is uh, is in there that uh, the assumption of continuity is definitely uh, a foundation to the theory. Can't argue that point. Well, thank you very much. I, I think the time has come to wrap up and. Um, so I think it devolves upon me to, to do it in maybe a civilized way rather than just have us cut off suddenly. Um, f first of all, I I'd like to thank <coughs> Harry very much um, for all the work he's done in presenting this second uh, analysis for us. In fact, I, I haven't been surprised at the depth of his um, research and uh, you know the clarity of his exposition. And in fact, I I I'm not at all sorry that we're going to town uh, on this subject because there's so much in it. Uh, we, we've now had a second presentation from Harry, and uh, we're going to go on to another couple of presentations um, on Weber electronics and, and, and on maybe Kelly's experiments. But um, there are a number of novel things uh, from, from my part that were introduced, the, the whole concept of superconductivity, which I'll have to be looking at a bit more, and indeed mentioning Thomas Jefferson and his contribution to the inductive method, along with his other... Um, political uh, achievements. Um, Harry's work, um, you know, although indicating maybe what many of us dissidents, dissidents have found in many respects, for example, Einstein's special theory of relativity, that people do experiments to prove their preconceived ideas. You know, this may have been the case uh, in a lot of the experiments with regard to unipolar induction. Um, but he seemed to... Um, give a lot of uh, brownie points to the Maxwell theory, the flux linking theory. Um, and and yet, um, maybe some of his results, I don't know if I totally understand it, but he says, uh, you know, some of his results seem a bit disconcerting. That he, he says we base a lot of um, things on test assumptions, which need to be fundamentally looked at. Maybe we should do, be doing some experiments on the axioms rather than on the phenomenon, which we know a, a lot about. And um, perhaps these will um, result in our scrapping a lot of concepts such as EMF or electromotons, maybe we, we ought to call it because it's not really a force. It's, it's a derivation of a force. Um, and, and maybe, uh, you know, arrive at a completely new theory. So, so, so that might be uh, one way to, to, to go forward. Um, I, I have my own ideas on, on, on this. I, I would not be not quite as radical with regard to condemning the scientific method. I, I think it's just the way it's been um, applied and uh, you know, the people wanting to, to prove preconceived ideas. But um, a lot of philosophical questions will need to be addressed in the coming weeks when we come back to this, because I've, I've been emailing a few people uh, on, on these issues and they're really philosophical or conceptual. And some of the comments uh, actually have, have echoed these, such as whether lines of force being not a real thing, whatever real is, uh, or is it useful? Um, uh, I, 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 some people, some person made, made that comment a couple of times. I think it might have been uh, yeah, um, one of the members here. But uh, we, we need to consider uh, whether things like that are actually useful 
And if they are useful, well, then we can start talking about whether the field uh, rotates with the magnet and indeed where is the seat of the EMF. And in fact, I I'm hoping to deal with those myself when I discuss Kelly's um, presentation. So uh, let me see. We have two more from Cornelius here. What seems important in recognizing that magnetic fields are themselves manifestations of moving charges? And this being the case, all induction um, it th is the result probably of relative motions of charged particles. What needs to be understood is what defines a charged particle. <coughs> yes. Um, well, well, I, I, I'm hoping to, to do that. And, you know, as I say, for my humble part, I, I don't think we need a, a, as radical um, um, a review of the scientific method, which has been used ostensibly to analyze the subject of unipolar induction over many, many years. Robert K., what about uh, Robert Kemp's magnetic flywheel induction engine motor generator patent? Um, are you familiar with that, Harry? From Robert Kemp, no. Okay, well, anyway, we, we, we've more or less run out of time. So I'd like to thank you all very much. No, no, no. no. What did you say, no or yes? No, you're not familiar, yeah. It's a, it's a particular patent we'd have to look at. No, I'm sorry, it's just a lag. Okay, and uh, I, I'm speaking a bit quickly because we, we only have a couple of minutes left. And I don't know what the penalties are for going over time. I, I take it they're not financial. But I'd like to thank you all, and particularly um, people in the green green room like um, like Eric and um, uh, James and uh, Bob and so on. Sorry we didn't have time to, to discuss the matters further with Harvey and Cornelius and so on. Uh, um, but, but we'll <coughs> come back to that in the coming weeks. I, I'd also like to thank Franklin very, very much for, for keeping me on the straight and narrow. I hope he has. I haven't made too much of a mess of it. Uh, he's helping technically, technically, and he's been helping putting up these comments because I might have been missing some of them now and again. Uh, so I say provisionally, we, we'll have the announcement out very soon, but provisionally we're hoping uh, the, um, ne next week will be a regular meet. No, sorry. Next week will be another meeting. Uh, which will be Bob Gray uh, speaking about the Weber uh, electronics, um, uh, electromagnetic induction analysis of the whole situation. Wilhelm Weber, as uh, or Weber, I think you tend to pronounce it. I tend to adopt the Germanic pronunciation Weber, uh, which Harry mentioned uh, in, in detail. And um, after that, um, may, it might be two weeks after that, I'll be speaking more about Kelly's uh, experiments, which... Uh, Alf Kelly's experiments, which took place um, in Dublin over a period of, of three years. So thank you very much, uh, everybody, and um, uh, thanks for your attention. And I'll end the broadcast now. <laughs>